Hey guys, here we are again with another edition of Interactive Wrestling Radio right here on WrestlingEpicenter.com. Coming up in just a moment, we're going to have three guys, three for the price of one, which is free, by the way, on our show today. It's going to be none other than the Iron Sheik, as well as his producer from the new movie The Sheik, out now on DVD, or March 1st, I should say, on DVD. His name is John Megan. And our second guest of the week is The Pug, Alex, Speech Bully, Porto, really good guys, all three great interviews. Sheik doesn't say a whole lot, but hey, that's okay, he's the Iron Sheik, he doesn't have to. Hope you guys do check this out, check out the DVD, it's available, like I said, March 1st, Amazon.com is a good place to get it, and as well as your local Walmarts and so forth, from what I understand as well. So check it out, pick it up. And enjoy these interviews, and we'll be back at the end of the interviews to do a top five list of guys who should be in the WWE Hall of Fame that are not currently. Enjoy, and we'll see you in just a few minutes. Hey guys, you're listening to Alex Porto at the Wrestling Epicenter. This is Bob Backlund, and you listen to Interactive Radio. And sit up straight when I'm talking to you. <laughs> Welcome back to Interactive Wrestling Radio. On the Newsmaker line with us right now is two gentlemen. First of all, it's the producer of the new movie, The Sheik, which is out on DVD March 1st, and that is... John Megan, and his subject matter for the documentary, the one and only WWE Hall of Famer and World Champion, the Iron Sheik. Guys, are you with us? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. How you doing, man? I'm doing great. Mr. Sheik, are you there? Yes, sir. Oh, sir, it's a certainly a pleasure to talk to both of you gentlemen. And uh, I wanted to ask you, I just watched the documentary last night. It is phenomenal. Is this going to be the closest we're going to see to an autobiography of the entire life of the Iron Sheik? Well, uh, the Sheik's life is, is he's still kicking, right? He's like the <laughs> Betty, he's like he's like the Betty White of wrestling, right? He's uh, he's seventy four years young, mm -hmm. and uh, you know I, I think he's his book is still being written, right? He's not finished, so awesome. um, definitely. Up until a certain point, it tells a story, which is uh, which we did our best to kind of tell through uh, through his life. And you know, now I think that you know, if we kept on filming, we'd have discovered so much more. Like now, the Sheik's going to the Professional Wrestling Hall of Fame. Absolutely, down, which is now going to be moving to Texas, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, I didn't know that. I know, I know that he's got to go to uh, hopefully uh, Iowa this summer. Yeah, right, Sheik. Yes. All right. And uh, I, I've got to tell you, and this might be more for Gian than, than for Mr. Sheik, and while I was watching it, I was really impressed with how you guys skirted the issues uh, in terms of copyright. Uh, you guys had the announcer calling the action exactly the same way that Gorilla Monsoon called it in that famous match between Sheik and Hulk Hogan. How did you guys uh, decide to do that, and was there any interest in WWE being involved in the project? So uh, it's a very good question. Um, unfortunately, uh, you know, we we were not granted the use of their of any footage. We had definitely asked, and uh, we understand that you know they run a business, and uh, I guess if they're not making the project or have are involved in the project, they're probably not going to you know give the footage away, right? Right, right. And uh, we weren't in a position to take any chances, uh, you know. Um, you know, you could have gone the, I think it's called fair fair usage um, way. You know, where you know we want to respect the WWE, and so um, we we did it on our own, and uh, we were able to uh, creatively tell the story uh, and not use their footage. Um, and I guess uh, you know, you know, if you're telling me you liked it, then you know, then that's uh, one more person just. Uh, re reaffirming the fact that, you know, uh, the story was told without the footage. 
Absolutely. It was told without the footage. And another great help of it is even though you did not do this with WWE's backing, you have Hulk Hogan, you have The Rock, you have Jimmy Snuka, you have Jake Roberts, you have all these legends of WWE fame on there talking about Sheik almost as if it was a WWE done DVD, but also done maybe a little bit more honestly because you guys are not obviously jaded by the WWE uh, rose-colored glasses. Yeah, so, so the, the whole point of, of the entire uh, process was my, my twin brother and I grew up with this man. He, mm-hmm. uh, he's, a, he's a family member, practically, being best friends with our father in Iran. And, um, you know, we're not filmmakers, right? We're, we're entrepreneurs. We, we have uh, multiple businesses here in Canada, but we, we definitely didn't know what we were doing. But the whole time, what we set out to do was to tell uh, a story that would, you know, be the positive and it took a bit because there were some negative uh, portions of his life that um, actually when we first started producing the film and directing and making it it was it was uh, for all intents and purposes it was a bloodbath right it was like yeah it was it was, cow. Like, it, it was heavy to watch Jerry, in that middle portion of yeah, that DVD yeah. it was like it was like Jerry Springer right it was like and we were like, oh, my goodness, we can't do that. You know, look, we're not here to take advantage of anyone. We're, we're here to – we were just doing it for fun, like, you know, because we had the access. And, um, you know, I, I, I we're so happy that in the end, you know, all those amazing changes uh, happened, you know, and the Sheik is now as popular as ever. And the Sheik is as popular as ever. And, and one of the things I wanted to ask Sheik about is – do you think doing this documentary, for all those who know you now as the very outspoken, hysterically funny guy on Twitter and YouTube who says a lot of the things that some of us are thinking and some things that I don't think any of our brains could go to that direction, um, do you think that maybe being so seen as a humorous guy now, people forget the amazing story you have coming from Iran? That's not a character, folks. You are from Iran. Does this really shed some light for those who don't know your backstory from being a fan for 30-plus years? Does this documentary give them an opportunity to find out that, hey, the Iron Sheik was for real. He was legit. He was a legitimate amateur wrestler in Iran and in the United States. Absolutely, sir. I'll just say I grew up with the, with the toughest sport in the world, Olympic wrestling, and uh, uh, all my life, only thing I did wrestling to I make it to America to go the, all over the world, all over the coast to coast America. And um, like I said, Pashman and she I know me better than anybody. And um, my English is not really that much good, so I can explain everything. But you can ask Jean uh, whatever you want. Uh, just <laughs> true story about her. Absolutely. Uh, if, if I could jump in, she gets too sweet, man. Um, <laughs> the, 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 the reality of, of the situation is, and I and I'm, you know, I'm a fan, man. I'm a huge fan, and uh, and I'm just lucky. I was lucky enough to be granted this opportunity to to spend time with my childhood hero, and then I also had the guts to go out on a limb and 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 make this documentary. So 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 I did it, and I'm happy that this happened. And the results of it are are really great because I, I go on Twitter every other day and I check out what people are saying and so many people had no clue. They 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 had no clue about the real man Khosrow Vaziri. They had no idea about his background. They had no idea that he was a grandfather and that he's actually you know aside from being like a really loud and rambunctious character. You know, he's a just a, he's just a, he's a great man, and he's a grandfather, and he's a husband, and, you know, and a father, right? Right. No, and, I, um, to be honest with you, and I've been a fan for 30-something years myself, you know, one of my earliest memories, and this is legitimate, was watching that famed match with Hulk Hogan. You know, that was like the beginning of wrestling for me, and I'm, you know, I'm 35 now. I'm going to be 35 in September. I was just a toddler watching it then, and I thought that was amazing watching it back then. I had no idea, even with the Internet and the inside things that are available to us now, where there's very much no secrets for people, I had no idea about Sheik's wife being, um, you know, so well-spoken and having having the children and having the grandchildren. It's just an amazing thing to see. 
um, from somebody that I never expected that from. Yeah, no, it's um, definitely, you know, it's it just, it helps, it helps make this film even greater to watch, right? Because you get your fix as a wrestling fan. And, you know, one of my favorite, you know, um, uh, you know, compliments I've gotten are from like females or from people who, you know, got dragged into watching it because they lost the vote that night. It's what, what movie they're watching. Yeah, like my who wife last night. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Who couldn't, who couldn't care about wrestling, right? And, you know, like, it's just nice, right? It's, it's like, it's nice. And, you know, look, I'm just like, I'm, like I said, I'm just like, my, we're just two guys who, who were granted an opportunity and we're blessed for it. And, uh, you know, we're, we're so happy that this is, um, this is, this has happened and the man's getting yeah. a view. And, um, you know, now if we could just get his, uh, get the surgery done on his knee and ankle, you know, yeah. so he can, you know, get back, get back in the ring, it'd be great. <laughs> That would be awesome, and it would, I, that was something that was touched on a lot as well was his uh, ankle injury, and so forth. Um, Mr. Sheik, when you've watched this documentary yes. back and you saw the dark places uh, that they started filming you at, when you watch it now and you and you go to these conventions and so many people love you and admire you and and celebrities as well as as you say the intelligent wrestling fan, do you? feel like you've come a long way from where that documentary first started, where you guys were in a dark place. Yes, and uh, I think they did a great job because it's true story about Aaron Sheik, and I'm very happy, and uh, Jean and Pashman and the family, everybody they did a great job. I'm very happy. Awesome, awesome. Let me ask you a question here. Um, it, it's somebody that wanted me to ask you this, and it involves um, the guy that we've talked about that you wrestled and, and lost the championship to, the Hulk Hogan. Um, my question is, what is your opinion currently? It doesn't revolve around the movie, but what is your opinion of the troubles that he is facing regarding his racial comments? Do you have any comments about Hulk Hogan, and do you think that he is, as they say, a, quote, racist? Well, uh, I think... I'm, I'm not racist. I, I like all my wrestling fans and my movie fans. And uh, that question, I think Jean can answer very clearly because uh, I, I really don't know what was the situation, but uh, if he was racist, he did a bad thing because I'm not racist. Okay. Yeah, you know, essentially, she's being a mensch right now and uh, <laughs> not, not, not crossing any, any political lines. Um, because he's in a different he's in a different place in his life. Unless you're Justin Bieber um, or Kanye West, you know he'll slash your tires. But uh, you know Hulk Hogan, you know w- w- you know Sheik got to where he is today because of Hulk Hogan, and Hulk Hogan got to where he is today because of the Sheik. Right. So there is there is a mutual respect for one another. Um, in the end, uh, I'll say this um, because uh, I'm a Sheik guy more than I'm a Hulk guy, right. uh, much more. Um, it looks like to me that the Sheik has become the ultra hot super baby face, and Hogan's the heel. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of weird how that turned. Absolutely, the, the, right. the irony of all that is just uh, is just so is so next level. It's, it's unbelievable. All right, absolutely, it absolutely is. I do have one other wrestling question, and then we'll get back to the documentary, and, and it is directed at the Sheik. Um, and it's something I always wondered as a kid, and hopefully you can answer this for me, because it bothered me. In the very early 90s, you returned to the WWF, and instead of calling you the Iron Sheik, even though you looked like the Iron Sheik, they called you Colonel Mustafa. And I was always curious, why didn't they just call you the Iron Sheik? No comment. I really don't know what to say. Uh, they, the company do whatever they want. So I'm not in charge for that. No comment. Okay. Just, um, All right. No problem. Cool. Well, I'll tell you what. I really enjoyed watching the documentary. And, and uh, to finish up on the Hulk Hogan comment, you guys did a really good job with the documentary telling the story of the way that it could have changed wrestling forever if he had taken Vern Gagne's offer. So you guys really did a great job of telling that whole story. And then going through all the dark times and then coming out the other end. So the, there's two stories to the Iron Sheik, two rises of fame. There's the wrestler 
And then there's now the the celebrity who we now know and love. And I've got to tell you, it's been an honor to talk to you, sir. I thank you for giving me your time, and I hope everybody out there will check out this DVD. It hits shelves on March 1st. You can order it through Amazon.com as well, and it's just simply called The Chic, and it's definitely something worth checking out. Um, Gian, is there anything you'd like to say? One last um, chance to, to plug people and send them in the right direction to find this movie? Yes, sir. You know, if you've ever been entertained in any way, shape, or form, by uh, wrestling in general, and especially the Iron Sheik, uh, you know, this is this is for you. Um, you know, this this was made for the fans by a fan. Um, we're really grateful for all the support, and uh, this is all done uh, positively from a good place. Uh, you know, we tried to keep it as authentic as possible. So check it out. Support the legend. Uh, and um, I am proud to say, if we're going to get a quick shameless plug, that. We are just finished filming our second documentary, which will be um, be announced shortly on another uh, all-time great. So we'll, we'll see what happens with that. Uh, you've done another documentary. Oh, see, and you say you're not a filmmaker, and there you go with another <laughs> another movie. Well, no, it, it, it sparked a whole another opportunity for us. So we're very grateful for, for what's come. All right. Well, I look forward to hearing about that. Gian, Mr. Sheik, it's been an honor talking to you as well, and I hope everybody's enjoyed this. And like I said, you can check this out. It's a Viat on Mon- uh, sorry Tuesday, March the first on DVD, and uh, it's called The Sheik. You can't miss you can't miss it when you uh, see the cover. So hope everybody. And one last thing, if anyone in the New York area, The Sheik will be at the big event um, on March the fifth. Right. That's right. Yeah, that's a big event coming up here just a just about a week away. All right. Well, hey, thank you guys. I appreciate it, uh, Mr. Sheik. Can I? Uh, I just want to say thank you again. And uh, Gian, please keep in contact. I'd love to help you promote your upcoming documentary as well. You got it, man. Thank you guys. All right, my pleasure. Thank you, sir. Have a good day. You maniacs! This is Hulk Hogan, the greatest of all time, <laughs> and you're listening to the Blaze. So, what you gonna do when Hulk Hogan in Blaze Mania runs wild on you? Hey, this is the Queen of Extreme Francine, and you are listening to the Interactive Interview. And welcome back. It's James Walsh, joined as always by Mr. Patrick Kelly. Hi, how are you? How's it, how's it, oh, sorry, screwed up. Uh, hi, how are you doing, James? I'll, I'll forgive it. Patrick recently had his uh, wisdom teeth. Uh, oh, what a, yeah, one of the side effects. I get dumber. <laughs> yeah, you lost your wisdom. Yep, yep. There you go, see? Anyway, but hopefully I speak better. Well, I mean, why? Was it, was it impacting your ability to speak? No, but it's, I don't know. It's just me. I, my dentist even told me I didn't have to have them removed, but I was just like, my mouth was just too crowded, I felt like, and it was harder to floss. I was like, screw it, I'll just get rid of the teeth. So, hmm. um, It'll be worth it in the long run. Hopefully so, hopefully so. We just finished up with the Iron Sheik, and we're going to jump to Alex Porto here in just one second. Um, we're going to do our post-show after Alex Porto, uh, which we'll talk about who should be in the Hall of Fame. But we wanted to join you guys in between the interviews so we don't go back-to-back. Uh, sometimes it can be a little heavy having two interviews back-to-back. Uh, but I wanted to talk to you just a little bit about this Iron Sheik movie that just came out. It's called The Sheik. Uh, it's out on DVD on March the 1st. And, Pat, I know you have not seen it unless – actually, I think it might either currently be or previously was on Netflix – so if it's still on there, check it out tonight. I'm not sure if it still is, but a tangible copy is actually being released on March the 1st. And it is a really good documentary. I went into it not knowing what to expect. And I'm going to tell you that to be tr- truthful with you. And I say that because I did not know much about the Sheik's personal life because that never really comes up much. You know, it's always... No, like, just, uh, well, I mean, he's so, like... The Sheik himself is so over the top and so boisterous that it's hard to, like, get, see any cracks beneath that because he's so, like, what Sheik's the type of guy that what you see is what you get, typically. So you don't really wonder all that much. Well, and he was in this interview. And I'll be honest with you. I'm a little bit disappointed with how the interview turned out. Um, I say that 
with all due respect, but I was told by the producer after the interview that Sheik did one interview, and uh, he feels that that's all he had to do. So he pretty much was just on the line while I interviewed the producer. <laughs> uh, but, he, but we asked him a couple things. Uh, anyway, a little bit disappointed. I kind of would have liked to have heard him go off on one about something or other, but eh, what are you going to do? Anyway, the, the, the DVD, though, that's coming out, really well done. And I, and I say this in all honesty. It could have been a WWE release, and they did a pretty cool job of, of skirting that issue. Um, they had a guy kind of cut promos for audio clips mimicking, literally, Gorilla Monsoon in the matches where she A won and B lost the championship. And it actually bridged that gap, because obviously they cannot use WWE footage um, on this thing. They bridged the gap pretty well on that, and I think that really helped out. The cool thing is they've got The Rock doing interviews on this thing. They've got Hulk really? Hogan. Yeah, they got Hulk Hogan doing interviews on this um, before he was uh, being charged with murder. Jimmy Snuka, Jake Roberts does interviews on this. Even Seth Green appears on this thing. And it's a really first-class production. <clears throat> it is not you know, a, a cheap production, which I, I did not know what to expect. Like I said, I didn't know much about his personal life, so I just assumed there wasn't much to know. But there's a hell of a lot to know. And uh, if you watch the documentary, you'll find that out. I mean, his daughter was murdered, which is why he went on his drug bender. Um, I mean, there's a lot more to than meets the eye um, to this guy. So hopefully people do check it out and don't just find out who he's calling a raisin dick or whatever <laughs> today on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> is that really him on Twitter? Yeah. No, that's him. Well, I, I have a feeling it's the guy who produced it. His name is Gian Megan. I believe he's the one who types it for him. But he calls him up and says, Hey, Sheik, what do you think about Justin Bieber? Well, let me tell you, Baba, Justin Bieber's a needle dick motherfucker, or whatever he says. And he runs with his, <laughs> he's like, Okay, needle dick motherfucker, send. You know? So that's kind of how I figure that goes. But yeah, I mean, and um, there you go. So hopefully wow. people do check this out. And uh, Alex Porto is our next guest. Alex Porto wrestled as. Alex the Pug Porto in the WWE, also wrestling Global Wrestling Federation, as the Beach Bully. He was even in Memphis, somewhere down south, as well as in Puerto Rico. And he even wrestled at WCW. And I was surprised at how honest this guy was. Um, he basically said the reason he never really got the big push is he never was comfortable with the microphone. And for a guy to admit, hey, I was good in the ring, but I did not have the charisma necessary to be a superstar – is a big admission because most guys, you know, point the finger of blame at anybody but themselves. Mm. That, is, that is very rare, actually, yeah. Yeah, so I, I was actually surprised to hear it to the point where I actually kind of said, dude, it's easy. Just, you know, just just go off on one. That's what you got to do. But anyway, I, of course, I, I speak, you know, very loose about that. Um Obviously, never having done it, then I'm sure it's a much different animal once you're faced with it. But anyway, I uh, hope everybody enjoys the Alex Porto interview, and we're going to be back. And our topic when we get back is going to be the top five guys that are not currently in the, in the WWE Hall of Fame that should be. So stay tuned for that, and be sure and post your comments on Facebook once we do post this. And right now, let's get to Alex Porto. This is Bobby the Brain Heenan, and if you're smart like me, you'll be listening to Interactive Interview. I do all the time. This is Terry Garvin Sims, and you're listening to the Interactive Interview. <laughs> Welcome back to Interactive Wrestling Radio on the Newsmaker line. With us right now is the Beach Bully, Alex the Pug Porto. Mr. Porto, how are you doing today? Good. It's been a while since I've heard that, but uh, it's uh, always uh, a pleasure. That was one of my favorite characters. Well, we've got quite a few quotes in there. We got I got the Beach Bully and the Pug in there, all in one intro, so that's pretty impressive, I think. Right, okay. Well, the Pug <laughs> was my most uh, recognition, I guess, but uh, the Beach Bully were... Uh, Certainly uh, my best matches. 
I, I would probably agree with that. I would probably have to agree with that. And with that being on ESPN Classic, like every uh, Thursday for five hours, certainly uh, comes in handy. You would probably get a lot of recognition off of that just based on the, the repeats. Yeah, actually I do, you know, and uh, matter of fact, when those were airing uh, back in uh, 90, 91, 92, you know, I was, uh, my friends were overseas and had gone off to, you know, college and, uh, uh, you know, uh, military, and they were watching me all over the world, and I got the feedback then, too. <laughs> That's very cool. Yeah, no, I mean, I was a kid at that time. I was literally, you know, 10 years old in 91 when it started, and I remember vividly with my hand on the doorknob when they waiting for the bell to ring at school so I can get home get a snack and just get in front of the TV because in New Jersey it started at 4 o'clock, the uh, right. GWF. So, yeah, that was a big part of my childhood. It didn't last long, but it was a big part of everything. So that was uh, sure. a lot of fun to watch. Well, well, it was good timing, too, you know, because it was 3 o'clock every day, you know, 4 o'clock where you were at, and everybody would just be getting home and kind of catch it before the evening starts. And it was just it was a great, uh, great uh, time slot. It was. And the other cool thing was if you had friends come over, and because I wasn't a hermit, I did – you know, if I went over to a friend's house or they went over to our house, the cool thing was it wasn't taboo. You could put it right. on and they would watch it too. It wasn't like, uh, you know, you had an interest in something ridiculously bad. It was really a good show. And while obviously, you know, the bigger companies like WWE and uh, or WWF at the time and NWA, which became WCW, were the larger of the two companies – larger right. of the companies, uh, they'd still watch it with you. It wasn't like you were asking them to sit down and watch, you know, some indie out of nowhere. This was still quality wrestling. Sure. Absolutely. So you're currently training, and uh, you're training some guys, and I wanted to find out some more information on what Alex Porto is doing these days. Well, uh, you know, I'm raising a family down in Florida. Um, I, you know, part-time I go down to Team Vision Dojo that's uh, uh, sponsored by Larry Zabisco, Scott Hall, uh, I guess several names on it really, but those are the top top guys that pretty much uh, have um, have you know been the spokes spokesperson of the uh, um, uh, dojo. But uh, it's doing real well. We've had uh, Jesus Rodriguez come in, uh, y- Yoshitatsu uh, come in. Um, we've had uh, Solomon Crow, Sammy Callahan's been coming in doing some uh, some workouts with some students. Um, uh, Billy got stopped in uh, just this past week, so you know we're right here in Orlando, and there's not a whole lot here besides. NXT and you know a few a few other other indies, but as far as schools uh, in Orlando, and you got the you got the Dudley they got their the boys, yeah, the team 3D, yeah, right. and and they do well. They have their own uh, project down there, and uh, they uh, they do very well. Yes, absolutely. Did this uh, did the dojo used to be? I believe in wrestling. A matter of fact, it is. It's tied in with the same thing. Yes, that's a wrestling school, and then the I believe is uh, the promotion that runs out of that. That's that's right. Oh, very cool, because I know that we had Larry Zabisco on set up by, I believe, in wrestling probably about five years ago, so I had to think they were probably connected if they're in the, they're in the Orlando area together. So Right. Awesome. Good bunch of guys. I've, I've talked to the the guys who run their page several several times, so they seem to be a good group of guys, and I'm glad you're in with them. Yeah, uh, St. Laurent, is, uh, he books that thing, and you know he's been doing a lot of stuff, stuff with Conan and Kevin Sullivan and Jim Cornette, so uh, MSL, he's, uh, he's good people. No, oh, absolutely. And if I'm not mistaken, I think he was also involved in MLW, which used to run in uh, Florida as well. Uh, up in That's right. Florida, yeah. Yes, he was. All right. So now that I've uh, tested my acronym here, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about your career, if you don't mind. Um, I'm going to ask you, you worked so many different territories, and it's really a unique thing to see that you know, I have tapes of you in Memphis. I have tapes, obviously, of you in Global, um, in the you know, the wonderful sportatorium, uh, Puerto Rico. Is there anything that sticks out as the, the best environment to have wrestled, considering the vast variety that you've worked in? Um, well, you know, I did spend a whole lot of time in Memphis, although that was a great, great uh, hot area. You know, I tagged for Tony Anthony as uh, the Dirty White Boys, uh, the, uh, you know, after the original Lenny Denton had, uh, you know, gone his own way. Uh, and that was an honor. Uh, I wasn't there very long, but I did learn a lot about tag team wrestling with Tony Anthony, and that was strong, very strong. Uh, but when I went to Puerto Rico, I, I stayed there for two years, and, and you know we we would do TV on Wednesdays and then Thursday through Sunday. We do have shows around the islands, you know. And, and when you're 21 years old, working five nights a week, 
uh, in a territory with different finishes every night. That's how you learn how to work, and and uh, and, and that's what stood out the most to me was probably Puerto Rico. I mean, that's uh, just a good old old school territory. Hot finishes every night, and um, and you know back then your boys were separated, so you weren't you had to learn how to work. You know, you didn't call fifteen thousand spots in the back and then go out there and do it. You know, like today they do it. So right. uh, you set a strong finish, and you went in there and played it by ear and uh, off the people. And uh, and we tore the house down for a long time out there. It was good. Very cool, very cool. And we've already talked a little bit about global, but it had to be a great breakthrough for your career to, to go from Puerto Rico and, and come into the Sportatorium and be on national television. Uh, I guess my question will be, uh, what was your overall opinions of global? And I want to talk to you a little bit after this question about you know their ultimate demise and so forth. But what was it like working for in that World famous sportatorium that man. I mean, I got to tell you, that's one of the. I've been to Madison Square Garden. I've been to Dodger Stadium. I've been to all these great places to see events, but I've never been uh, to the sportatorium, and unfortunately, that means I never will be. Right, right. Well, it's no longer there anymore. But exactly, it, it was, right. It was fantastic. You know, I had actually got my first break in world class in 1987. That's when I first. Uh, it was my first television taping was in the Sportatorium, and uh, that was with uh, Akbar, the one that kind of got me that position. And um, and then from there, I went to Tennessee. And from Tennessee, I went to uh, Houston, Texas, and started working out with Tom Pritchard and uh, Tiger Conway Jr. Uh, quite a bit. And uh, Booker T and Stevie Ray were down there. Ahmed Johnson, and these were all. This was all of us before we ever really, you know, became anything. Of course, Tom Pritchard and Conway Jr. They were strong names down there. Brother Love was, you know, Tom Pritchard's brother, so he would right. come around quite a bit. He was actively Brother Love at the time. So, right. um, and then San Juan, and then back to the Sportatorium uh, in in ninety one ninety two. Um, but uh, Sportatorium was awesome. It really was. Um, uh, I had the the best opportunity of working with the older guys like Devon Eriks and and Al Perez and Jimmy Jack Funk and Chris Adams. Those were prior to going to Tennessee and being the Dirty White Boys. When I came back from San Juan in ninety one ninety two, all those guys were kind of you know you know they filtered out and uh, you know uh, of course Devon Eriks did what they did. But then I was working with Chaz and you know uh, Calvin Knapp, um, Booker T was in there, um, uh, Bradshaw. So you know the system had changed quite a bit. Um, so the first time was WCCW World Class, and then the second time after San Juan in '92, '93, uh, it was Global. So That's big right. difference. Absolutely, absolutely, and that was a great company to watch. And like I said, we talked a little bit about it. Uh, I want to go over a little bit of the history because you mentioned World Class had worked. Obviously, they are the most iconic company that worked in uh, uh, the Sportatorium. But after Global came the NWA. Crockett tried to get himself started again. He started working in the in the Sportatorium. And I've got some of those tapes, and it's a very weird thing to watch because it just felt like it just never really got its footing. Uh, you worked there. What yeah. was your take of Crockett's attempt at redoing the NWA from the Sportatorium? Well... But, you know, he owned an ice cream shop in there, and I think he just wanted to try to make do with what he had. Really, the only, he only brought in, like, Dick Murdoch and then maybe a couple other strong names. It was nothing nothing extravagant like he had been used to running, you know, out in the Carolinas for years. I mean, so he was trying to make do with what he had there, I guess, more so on the budget end of it. And uh, it just kind of it, it, it lasted maybe six months, if that, and uh, and, and it was over. Yeah, it, it it seems to be like a forgotten chapter that this that they even did try to do anything after. Uh, yep, and that was the very over. last thing when it, when that was over. It was it was it was all done. Well, yeah, they had Continental, but most people have a, a pretty unsavory view of that. So, I'm sorry, they had what? Uh, Continental Confederate Wrestling Federation in uh, Dallas. In Dallas, yeah, they ran after. After okay. NWA got out of town, and it was apparently basically like bodyguards uh, wrestling, not no real talent. And gotcha. then, uh, okay, that's probably yeah. why I don't recognize it. That's right. Yep. Yeah. And uh, I mean, from what I understand, there were some guys that that did book it, like James Beard was involved in trying to help it, but you know, okay. without any talent, yeah, yeah. you didn't have anything. So. Sure. All right. Well, now we've reached the point where we could talk about probably your your most known run, which was the run with the World Wrestling Federation. Now, uh, you ran there. You were part of a bunch of guys who seemed to go in there and, and all had names going in. 
uh, pre-built prior to WWE. Tracy Smothers and so forth went in as uh, yeah, Floyd. Bill Irwin, yeah, sure, the Tom Goon. Brandy, uh, yeah. Yeah, Tom Brandy and Sal Sinceri, and there was a bunch of guys that went in that had a pre, you know, a pre-existing reputation. Sure. Um, so you got to keep your name though, which was pretty cool. Everybody else had to change theirs. What was it like uh, working for World Wrestling Federation, and why was it such a short-lived stint? Well, you know, I think um, I think they, you know, none of us really knew what they were bringing us in for, to be honest with you. But come to find out, after we've been there for you know a, a few weeks, we had. They were using enhanced talent on the road, and a lot of those guys didn't have builds. They, they they could work somewhat, or they wouldn't have been there, but they just didn't look like athletes. So, you know, Vince and, and, and the office are like, well, you know what, let's hire a crew. Let's put them on board. Let's take them around with us, and, you know, they'll get our guys over on Raw, and then we'll put them over on uh, on, on, on Superstars on Tuesdays. So, you know, it's just kind of what it turned out to be, you know, and uh, – um, that, that was that was really about it, to be honest with you. And uh, you know, we all we were all there under two years, and uh, and it just kind of faded out. That's whenever they really went to really high end matches back then. They kind of faded out with the with the enhancement guys. Absolutely, yeah. And it's been that way ever since, which is either good right. or bad. It depends on your opinion. Sure. Um, I got to ask you. This is something we ne- you probably never been asked before, but I'm going to ask. They gave you the Steiner Brothers old theme song. Did you have any pick over that, or, or what was the reason that they gave you such a, a a strange choice for theme music? You know what? I have no idea. The, you know, the, the very first night uh, after King of the Ring, I uh, we had Monday Night Raw. I didn't work that night, but the very next night was Superstars. Um, I had Barry Horwitz that evening, and for the first time he put me over to, to bring me into the company. And that, that was the music that hit whenever they said, okay, Alex, you're on deck, you know. And that, that was it. I mean, I had – they never really came to me with that. I just assumed it was all set up. I mean, um, so uh, the only thing that they really um, – did heavy right there was the character you know uh i just told him i was an amateur wrestler out of high school that was one of the last things i told him out of all the other gimmicks the dirty white boys the beach bully right you know right. just alex porto and and uh other than that uh music was never spoke of yeah that's always a question that people ask us wrestling nerds we, we like our theme music so we like to ask silly questions like that uh, you mentioned gimmicks, and, and I wanted to go back to something you did in Global, which I thought was very awesome. It was short-lived, but when you guys used to bring the Super Soakers down to the ring, yeah. I thought that Sean was Summers. you and Sean Summers, yep, that, as the Beach Bullies. That was something that I really thought could get over, and I'll tell you, I got a I got a, uh, a Super Soaker that summer, and I filled it all the way up with water, and it was like, holy, this thing is heavy, man. But uh, right. <laughs> But, uh, I mean, that had to be something that was very cool. I mean, it was funny when you guys would score people. Why was that such a short-lived thing uh, to do in, in Global? Obviously, your tag team was as well, though. Well, to be honest with you, we did get some mileage out of that. I mean, we, we actually did that for a long time. Um, and Bill Irwin put that together. Yeah, I had actually came back to Puerto Rico, and Sean Summers, he was the beach boy, and he actually had that gimmick. And then, and then Bill Irwin's like, you know what? Alex, next week you're the beach bully, and then you've got Sean Summers as the beach boy. You guys are a new tag team. So, and then that's how it all started. Bill Irwin put it together, and uh, we actually ran that for 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 quite a while. Um, and then I think Sean maybe had uh, kind of uh, quit coming in as much. I mean, he was only up in Oklahoma, and I was right there in Dallas, and they kept it on me for a little while because it was strong. I mean, they did well. But yeah. uh you know, and I and I had that all the way to ninety four until I came to Florida, so and which is whenever uh, uh global finished up. Exactly, exactly. Now there seems to be a missing portion of your career. After the WWF days, it seems like there was like a missing portion and then you resurfaced again in the Florida independent circuit working for uh uh, various outlets there with, with stars such as Daniel Bryan. I mean, you really worked with some uh, big guys who, who went on to be pretty big names in this business. Uh, what happened? What did you do after you left the WWF? Well, I had children. I had a daughter, and she was premature, and it required a lot of time at the hospital. And um, yeah, it's just the personal side of the pug. And 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 I just kind of I had I was content. You know, I started in '87. I finished in '97 strong. I had ten good years. Um, you know, I'd been in Japan several times. I had worked with a lot of great talent. Um, I had worked in the Garden, Berlin, Tokyo, Seoul, Korea, 
you know, San Juan, Dallas, Vancouver. I mean, I'd gone all over, you know, Miami. So I was happy. I was content, you know. Um, and to be honest with you, um, uh, WWE was taking off at a time there where, um, you know, either you were really, really good or you just weren't going to be there. And I was a great worker, but my my charisma wasn't really as popping as, as a lot of guys there. And that's what it took to continue there, I think. And, and I think Tom Brandy got a, a good taste of that. I mean, he was one of the in, – in, in, uh, Tracy Smothers also. I mean, they kind of kept them around just a little bit longer. But even even those guys, you know, as good as they are, it just didn't it just didn't it didn't take off. So we all faded out. Yeah, a lot of guys did there. <clears throat> there was a lot of gimmicks there that they that they had around the uh, the ninety five to ninety eight period. I mean, there was yeah. some good ones, and then there were some bad ones. <laughs> right, right. There you go. Uh, all right, so I guess I'll, I'll wrap up with you know what is it that you uh, are hoping to do now? I mean, obviously you, you, I've seen you post on Facebook that you are. Not full time, but you still like to get in there. So, what is your um, your objective here with getting back in the ring and, and helping the train? Well, I just try to give these young kids coming in now good, good, solid advice and guidance. You know, you can't find that on the road. You know, working with these indies, um, you you find it in a good school. You know, and and a lot of people uh, they'd rather not pay the money and go to a school and just get out on the road. But you, you know, there's a lot of things you learn in that direction and there's a lot of things you don't. And, um, and, uh, yeah, that's where I'm at. I mean, I'm, I'm really big into the psychology and telling a story and painting a picture. Uh, I'm really big in, 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 in playing off the people and not, you know, throwing everything together in the back. So trying to really, uh, make a difference in the, in these guys that are getting on the road out of the, uh, believe dojo, team vision dojo. So, um, just, uh, just coach, you know, a couple of three nights a week down there, but we got some morning classes. So, uh, just trying to get back to what was once given to me. That's all. That's a really good approach, man. I really appreciate it. I got to tell you, you always were, you always were one of the guys that I thought could have been capable of a lot more, uh, that they gave you. And I appreciate yeah. that you spent this time with us, man. You had a really good career. Like I said, not many people can say they, Worked in Memphis, worked in Sportatorium, worked in uh, Puerto Rico, and also made it to the WWF and worked uh, Madison Square Garden. I mean, not a lot of people yeah. can say that. So that's de- definitely a feather in your cap. Definitely, you know, and and, and, I, and I worked with a lot of great talent in WCW. You know, Billy Kidman, Dean Malenko, Fit Finley. I had some solid matches down there. And the work was always there, but then it kind of went to an era where, okay, here's a microphone. And you know, I struggle with that a little bit, you know, I guess. And uh, and, and that's just kind of where the business kind of split hairs with me. Why is that? Why do you think you struggled with the, um, you know, the mic skills? Because talking to you here, you know, you could, and, and I shouldn't give anybody ideas because they've done this in the past, but you could pass for yeah. Stan Lane. You're a good talker. I mean, you you got a great, powerful voice. You're poised. Why was it that you had trouble with the microphone? Well, it's different, just one-on-one conversation on a telephone. But when you're standing in the middle of a ring and 10,000 people are looking at you and you've got to, you know, throw a skit out, it's a little bit different, you know. It really is. I mean, it's like night and day. Right, right. Yeah, so until you've done it and tried it, um, you know. And, and to be honest with you, I was really never put in position to – um, to have really done it, not not that I really couldn't have. I, I shouldn't say that I probably couldn't have, but um, I just wasn't as strong. I wasn't a natural like 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 Jericho. Jericho, he grabs the mic, just goes at it. You know, uh, uh, it's just several guys like that. You know, and um, it's just kind of uh, where the business led to. You know, and uh, and and I just uh, it was tough on a lot of guys. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, look at guys like Brad Hart. When they started, they were really not good on the microphone, but right. with enough exposure and enough uh, practice in it, they got to where they were above average. So, sure. I mean, and it's so insulting for me to say Brad Hart's above average. I mean, he's one of the greatest of all time in terms of in ring work. But you know, microphone maybe not quite the best, but uh, definitely sure. in the ring, one of the best ever. Anyway, man, I really appreciate you spending this time with us. I enjoy reading your Facebook posts. Your uh, you and I are pretty much on the same wavelength on a lot of stuff, I think. So that's always a good thing to uh, to find on a on a on a wrestler. And I'm finding that more and more. The more older I get, the more I'm finding I get along with the the older. No offense, not older. You're only a few years older than me, but guys that are yeah. a little bit older than I am. So I appreciate it, man. And uh, where well, can find, folks find out more about Alex Porto, or maybe reach out and say hello to you? Uh, well, just you know, Facebook. Uh, hit me a like on there, and then or a request, and I'll. Uh... 
and there's Alex Porto Universe as well, uh, WWE Universe. Uh, there's a page out there. Um, but, um, you know, hit me with a messenger. If you want to book me, that's fine. I, I'll come in. I, I'm still doing a few things. Um, you know, uh, I'm not going to come in and work a main event for 45 minutes, but, um, you know, unless the money's strong. But uh, love to love to come out and do conventions, and um, you probably get some stuff coming up in Dallas in April. So uh, with the WrestleMania thing, uh, that should be uh, real well. I know uh, Sam Houston, Rod Price, uh, uh, Stevie Ray's probably going in. Several, several talent, you know, outside of WWE will be there. So uh, looking forward to Dallas in uh, April. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I did talk to Rod Price. He was excited about getting the opportunity to head down to to Dallas for WrestleMania weekend and do some of those con- conventions, the cons that are going to be down there that weekend. It sounds like it's going to be a big wrestling environment. Probably the biggest Dallas has seen since World Class was going strong. Yeah, and, and you know, actually Kevin Von Erich's uh, uh, book to make an appearance at WrestleMania, too. So, that, you know, I mean, doesn't get any better than that for Dallas. Absolutely not. All right, man. Well, take care. Uh, I wanted to leave you with this thought. I've been bothering you for an interview since you had a members.aol <laughs> website it goes back at least 15 years so or at least 13 years so wow. uh yeah i've been bothering you for a while so i'm glad we finally were able to get in contact and and make it happen and i hope um if you ever have anything that you want to promote in the future a book or anything like that just let me know and i'd be happy to help you promote it hey absolutely man it's been my pleasure and uh you guys take care and uh we'll see you down the road now Hey guys, this is Taylor Hendricks, and you are listening to Wrestling Epicenter. Check it out. This is Jake the Snake Roberts. No doubt, you must be listening to the interactive interview, and you better keep listening. All right, we're back. Hope everybody enjoyed the interview with Alex the Pug Porto. Great guy down in Orlando. There's a lot of good wrestling down in Orlando now, man. They got they got the dojo he works at, which is part of I Believe in Wrestling, as well as the Dudley Boys Academy. And they've even got themselves a, a little thing you might have heard of called the WWE Performance Center. So, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Orlando's a pretty good spot for wrestling these days. Yeah, it is. It used to be TNA time. I don't know what they're doing nowadays, but... Um, well, I love Tina. Um, I just had this conversation with a, with a wrestler named Scott Brown, and Scott's over the top, even for me. He He's like, you know that I post basically whatever the hell I'm thinking, and I really don't think much about. Might this offend somebody? But his posts actually go over my head, and it's like, yeah, I would never go that far. Um, but we were having this conversation, and he said, look, it's 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 so important for TNA and ROH and Lucha Underground and Paragon and all these other companies to survive. And, um, yeah, I mean, TNA, I, the reason I started saying that is because I was thinking TNA did a big filming in, in July of last year, and that's what they aired until January. I mean, and that's Just scary. About, yeah. That's really shitty, man. I'm serious. Through December, they were airing the same thing that they had taped in July. Granted, they did Bound for Glory in between that, but you know, that's you know that that's one show in between. Well, I remember they did that one taping where it felt like they had like a hundred matches, and I was like, "What the hell are they doing the show?" And it turns out they were just doing that big ass tournament, which nobody really cared about, and I still don't know who won. Um, EC3 did. Oh, that's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. I remember. That was oh man, that was really weird. And you can't get a crowd reaction. If they don't know what the hell is going on, how are they going to react to it? So mm-hmm. it's a, it was a really bad idea. I don't like the idea. I get it. It was a cost-cutting measure, but, man, it, it sucked. Um, and their ratings are tanking now because when they came back and they, and they debuted on Pop, the rating was strong because it was a fresh new show. Um, it was live. And it seems like it's kind of hit that wall again where, okay, now we're watching a canned show again. And mm. it, the, the downward spiral begins for the ratings. Anyway, we promised you guys we would do our top five list, and we haven't done one of those in forever. Uh, in fact, I don't think we've done one since Nick Noel was on our show. Yeah, way back in the day, yeah. Good old Nick. How's he doing? 
I think he's doing okay. He's uh, all of that a bit. Seems happy. I like Nick. I, I, and I do like Nick. He just needs to, to chill out. That's all. A little bit of a TNA shill. Speaking of, <laughs> I still a little bit of a TNA already, but you know, a little bit, a little bit too much of a TNA shill. But good dude, and uh, hopefully one day we'll patch things up. Anyway, um, top five list this week is going to be the top five guys that are not currently in the WWE Hall of Fame. That should be, and that does not. I'm going to preface that by saying that does not include Hulk Hogan or Jimmy Snuka because they're in. Whether they're listed on the website right now or not, they're in. So they're not part of that list. Um, and it does not also include Hacksaw Jim Duggan, who I always put number one because he is in. So I can't use him this week in, in the, on our top five list. But um, all right, do you want to go first? Sure. Uh, how are we going to do this, one at a time or just list the whole thing? Yeah, let's let's list it down, your, yours first, then mine, and we'll argue it down if we want to argue it or just agree to disagree. Okay, cool, cool. All right, my, my number one is Owen Hart. Uh, here's a guy who was with the company for years, been part of the Hart family, um, passed away under very tragic circumstances, unfortunately. Uh, not a main eventer, or at least not a main eventer mainstay, but always, uh, always a very, very good hand, very talented, very entertaining. And uh, he's probably, like, the most famous name left that's not in, at least as far as I can think of. He's the one that... Okay, now that um, Savage is in and San Martino are in, Owen's probably now the big one that everybody's demanding go in. And the problem with that is that his wife is kind of blocking that, which I can, to be fair, you know, some wrestling fans want to call her a bitch or whatever, but I kind of look at that and I go, eh, I can kind of understand where she's coming from. But, uh, I mean, you try going through what she went through and then see if you want to, you want to remember uh, wrestling in any way, shape, or form. So I can kind of at least understand where she's coming from. But Owen's my number one pick. Um, number two is one of Owen's old partners, uh, Davy Boy, the British Bulldog. Um, and even like I can even caveat that and say maybe the British Bulldogs go in as a tag team together. But um, yeah, he, again, great guy, very talented. Um, you know, great power guy, great in singles, great in tag teams, great in main events, great as the Intercontinental title ever. Uh, great at the intercontinental title level, sorry. Um, I don't think he ever, no, he never did win a world title, but back in those days, a lot of guys didn't win world titles. It wasn't like, you know, free candy. It, was, that was it wasn't, no, yeah, it wasn't passed around. Yeah, well, I mean, when we were in that period where there were two world titles and literally everybody was getting them, I'm like, all right, guys, this is a little ridiculous. I mean, come on. Jack Swagger's a former world champion. Come on, guys. This is, this is a little silly. But, um... Yeah, uh, Davey Boy is one of my big picks. Uh, we mentioned we were talking about this guy off the air, uh, Brian Tillman, another one who's unfortunately passed away. Man, all mine have passed away. That's really strange. But um, yeah, Brian Tillman. He uh, God, if he had the physicality that he had earlier on in his career mixed with the character that he had in the WWF, he would have been like if we we could have gotten to a point where both of those existed at the same time. He would have been amazing, but, you know, in his WCW days, his younger days, he was one of the very influential cruiserweight types. Uh, I, one of the weird things about him is that, like you said, he was a very influential cruiserweight type. His best matches were probably like 90, 1995, 1996, before the, right when he got injured. Right. And then he built this persona that was awesome. If they could have mixed the two, the awesome persona with the awesome ring work, I mean... We'd be probably talking about Steve Austin as the Marty Jannetty of the Hollywood Blondes. Let's be honest; that's probably what we would. Oh, no, I would. I would. I don't necessarily agree with that. I would take it a step further. You probably would have seen a WrestleMania headline by Austin versus Pillman. Very possibly. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's like you would have seen the case where they both became mega stars, and it would have been fantastic. But yeah, we'll never know, unfortunately. But uh, again, very influential personality, very influential talent, and deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. Um, who else did I have here? Uh, number four, this, uh, you know, and this is, I know technically, as far as I know, he's never worked for the WWE or wrestled for them, but they've really, the WWE has really branched out their Hall of Fame to include guys from outside of their company, like Vern Gagne, and uh, they've started including more and more Japanese names, and this is where this is coming from. I would say the Great Muda deserves to be in there. Uh, Great Muda was the first Japanese wrestler that I ever became a fan of. 
and I was always a, you know, he was, he was kind of, to me, he was kind of like the Undertaker of Japan, just this great, colorful gimmick, full mystery, uh, kind of scary, but also very cool, and uh, great entrances and presentation and all sorts of things. I mean, I just looked at that guy, and I was like, man, that guy, he's really cool. I really like him, and yeah, and I think um, he was an influential wrestler to a lot of people, and uh, really it was because of... Um, one of the reasons I'm a big fan of Sting is because of the matches that he had with Great Muda in the 80s and early 90s. So, uh, oh, yeah. I mean, if, you, if you were ever critical of Sting's work, the brutal matches that he had with Muda and Vader in oh, the geez. early 90s, I mean, th- they didn't hold back. They really were smashing the shit out of each other. So, mm-hmm. And it's funny you mentioned Vader because he's my number five. Big oh, Van yeah. Vader. Yeah, absolutely deserves to be in there. Again, his run in the WWE was not his best work, but his work in WCW, he's like one of the best big men of all time. Anybody going to argue with me on that? I doubt it. And then when he left WWE and went back to Japan, he was great again. So really, it's kind of the Scott Steiner effect, which I would even argue that Scott Steiner probably deserves to go into the Hall of Fame. But uh, Steiner um, brothers, I'll be honest with you, both both of them deserve to go in. Steiner, obviously, Scott had a bigger singles career, but you can't discount what the Steiner brothers were to tag wrestling. So I think right. they, if they go in, they should go in together. Right. Uh, but the thing with Scott is that he had such a bad rap on the internet from the smart marks and everything. I'm like, no, guys, he had one bad year in the WWE. Let's. Let's not let one bad year discredit his entire career. And I'm kind of the same way with Vader, where it's like, look, he had two mediocre years in the WWE. Can we just pretend that those didn't happen? (laughs) You know what I mean? I don't know that he was necessarily, like, physically unable to perform. I just think that they set barriers on, on what he was able to do and be that mm-hmm. prevented him from being the guy that we saw in WCW. Yeah. Because if you saw I him mean, in TNA last year when he faced Bram, he could still do the Vader bomb and stuff. He could still move around, and he's, you know, that's getting to be 15 years after he was with WWE. So, mm-hmm. I mean, oh, long, yeah, longer than that. Yeah, because we're talking like 98. There you go. Yeah, well, yeah, longer than that. You're right, 15, 16, 17 years now. Yeah, almost 20, believe it or not. Mm-hmm. Mm. Oh yeah, yeah. Exactly. One of the most influential big men of all time, without question. Absolutely, he he basically cracked the mold that big men couldn't do more aerial stuff. Well, it's funny. Um, there were when I first got exposed to wrestling. To me, the big guys were big fat guys, like the King Kong Bundys and the Earthquakes. And I'm not saying that those are bad necessarily. I'm just saying it was like that was those were big men to me. Those were the super heavyweights. And then I started seeing guys like Undertaker and Sid and Vader come along right. and they were yeah, and they could do a lot more and they could throw out moves like choke slams and power bombs and then guys like Sid had like this really chiseled body and Undertaker was really kind of tall and a little lanky but like really imposing looking and Vader was this he was a big fat guy but he could do fucking moonsault so it was like yeah. wow, that's really awesome. <laughs> yeah. So You know what I, I um, loved when you when we interviewed Sid, you were you said very much the same thing about him and and how he could do athletic moves and you and you mentioned the choke slam and power bomb. He's like you kind of just mentioned two of the most least athletic moves. <laughs> he he, he corrected well, you. It's, it's, you know, they were very like not a lot of guys were doing them back then. And no. Sid was the first guy that I ever saw do stuff like that. And I was like, "Whoa, <laughs> this like that's pretty cool." Well, I mean, when he was large humongous, he was doing missile drop kicks off the top and it's like Jesus, dude, that's that's impressive, and he kind of narrowed down his his move set even even in WCW, which was one of his better runs, which was even before he went and main evented WrestleMania with Hogan. Mm-hmm. I'll, then, I'll throw this Sid's way too. That dude deserves a Hall of Fame spot just for selling the Shockmaster the way he did. It's like, dude, he tried to save that. <laughs> oh my God! God. <laughs> <laughs> he tried to. Save it. Give Sid all the credit in the world. He tried to fucking save that whole disaster. He's you know, the only one that didn't break character. Oh, yeah. Sting was laughing. They were all laughing. Jesse Ventura basically never recovered the entire show. Just laughing his ass off. So. Davey Boy was like, selling his fucking ass. <laughs> selling his ass. We're live. You know, we're live. Oh, no. That was That was pretty bad, yeah. Oh, man. I mean, I think Sid should be in the Hall of Fame, and if he ever gets inducted in there, 
uh, he'll probably shake all over. <laughs> <laughs> For those who don't know what we're referencing, he cut some weird promos uh, when he was doing chasing Goldberg's record by basically just appearing in matches that are, that were already happening and, and pinning the guys that were down. Which mm-hmm. sounds really comical, but it kind of was cool, too. And um, he would just cut these promos, and, and Sid was not filtered at that point, so he was able to just say whatever came to his mind. And sometimes it was awesome, and sometimes it was cringeworthy. And, and the, the mixture was pretty hysterical. So if you ever um, if you ever have the time, search for it out either on the network or on YouTube and just look up some of the Sid promos from 1999. They're, they're great stuff. Anyway, yep. um, so there's your list. I got a list, and I'm going to take off Brian Tillman off mine since you already said him, uh, and add one more to mine so we don't actually have any that cross paths, believe it or not. Okay. All right, so I'm going to go with my number one. And it's probably greedy on my part, but I'm going to go with my number one who should be in, and it stems from the fact that Trish Stratus is in, and that's Miss Elizabeth. If you're going to have a woman in the Hall of Fame, the first woman of wrestling is Miss Elizabeth, regardless who gets the moniker this week. And the fact that she's not in it now that Randy's in it, it just seems incomplete. So she needs to be in there too. Um, I, I have a feeling that it has to do with the same reason that Owen's not in, that apparently Elizabeth's family doesn't want her to be in. But then again, right. they released a couple of action figures for her. And from what I understand, the toy companies make the deal with the person who owns the likeness to release said figures. So if that's the case, similar to the video games, when they put them in the video games, which she's also been in. So it stands to reason that if she's been in those and had her own action figure put out, that they're open to discussion. Uh, Whether that's going to be something that will ever happen or not, I don't know, but it should be. Um, Second on my list, Demolition. I mean, when you talk about tag team wrestling in the late 80s, early 90s, these guys deserve to be in there. I get why they're not in, and the reason they're not in is because they're the only ones that I can think of, except maybe Warrior, who fought the WWE and won uh, for the right to use the name. It didn't really ultimately amount to much. Um, You know, Demolition Axe and and Blast, or Blaze, I think it was Blast um, on the indies, wasn't exactly much. But they're back together again, um, you know, doing conventions and stuff now. There's no reason to hold a grudge anymore. They should be in the Hall of Fame. And Well, I think the other reason that they're not in, and you're absolutely right, they should go in. I'm a big demolition supporter, big fan. But one of the reasons that they're not going to go in and one of the reasons that their legacy has kind of been kicked to the side is because they've been labeled the quote-unquote Road Warrior ripoff. And it's not is, fair. No, it's totally not fair. Absolutely. My number three, I think I'm up to three. Three, is it? I think it's three. Three, is three. Ravishing Rick Rude. Oh, God, he's not in? He's not in. I thought for sure he was in. Nope, he is not in, and he definitely That's crazy. Should. Wow, um, yeah. When, when you talk about a guy who could just have a good match with anybody, and, and he was a muscle guy, too. I mean, he obviously some of that was enhancement, uh, but, you know, where do you draw the line on that? Who Who didn't use that kind of stuff back then? But when you talk about a guy who could have a good match with anybody, I mean, the the matches he even had with Warrior, who was not necessarily considered the greatest worker, a lot of the people who think Warrior was a good worker based that on his matches with Rude, because Rude was able to have good matches with just about anybody. I mean, he mm-hmm. had great matches with Sting. He had great matches with uh, Warrior, Piper. Steamboat. Though, Steamboat, of course, yeah. The line, it, you could just keep a, a parallel line going, and, and, and he's, or a continuous line, I should say, and, and he just had great matches with everybody. And that goes all the way through his WCW run, too, which is probably some of his better work. His early 90s. Oh, well, that's where I got the steamboat pull from. I remember that Iron Man match they had. Oh, yeah. That was, there was some great stuff with him. Uh, number four on my list is Hot Stuff Eddie Gilbert. Again, there's reasons he'll never go in. Um, has to do with their suing him, right, WWE, right now for the use of his likeness on things like the Mid South DVD. Uh, they're trying to get money out of him. It's not going to get them anywhere. It's frankly a silly lawsuit. But in terms of what he offered to wrestling, I mean, the guy was a genius when it came to, well, with, with women. Um, you know, he was married, to, I don't know why he married them, but he was married to Medusa and, and to Missy Hyatt legitimately, and from what I understand, he enjoyed quite a few of the others as well. Um, so he was hot stuff. He, that was not 
necessarily a persona. But in terms of in-ring psychology, I don't think there was many people better. And yes, his run in WWE was extremely brief. Um, his, See, I forgot he was in WWE. Cup of coffee. And the reason why he didn't last longer is because he's he was five ten, and in those days that was like being a midget. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You could not be five ten. They were not going to have that. So that's his biggest flaw. I mean, the guys like Jericho and and even Steamboat that that made it around that time. You know, obviously Steamboat was closer to his time than 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 Jericho was, but they have made it since then. You know, probably wouldn't have made it if they were there at the same time that. Gilbert was there, so amazing talent, amazing booker. I mean, he booked Memphis, he booked GWF, he booked a bunch of different places, and some of the stuff he did was considered amongst the best. So I really think he deserves to be in there. And my fifth one is I'm going to give credit to Lanny Poffo for posting this. Uh, his exact post was, "Hey WWE Hall of Fame, where the hell is Rick Martel?" Ooh, that is a good one. And when I heard that, my first thought was, let me shuffle through the memory banks here, because I know Tito's in. And I thought, geez, they never did put him in, did they? No. Yeah. So there's another one. I mean, and, and, and again, people will just think the model. And, yes, that was probably his most prominent run, but he was also the, the Can-Am Express, the Strike Force, uh, as well as an AWA run. He was AWA champion, which... You know, he got the belt off Bockwinkle. Nobody took the belt off Bockwinkle back then. So his... Uh, he had a run in WCW. He helped put Booker over. Yeah. yeah. He worked Booker a couple times, and he said, fuck this, and got out of there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I'm yeah. not kidding. He, he, if you ever hear an interview with him, and I'll have to try to get him for an interview, he said he got hit harder than he ever was hit in his life in a match with Booker T. And he said, fuck this. This ain't worth it. And he left. And uh, <laughs> uh, he was not apparently a really huge fan of uh, of working with um, uh, Harlem Heat, he, he book Stevie. So that's that's why his run there was so short because he figured he's getting hurt, and he said that you know it's it's not worth it. You know it's really weird because you never really hear people saying that about Booker T, but who by the way is in the Hall of Fame mm-hmm. uh, as being. Well, let's also like point this out, and I hate to be the douchebag that points this out, but I'm going ahead and. Gonna go ahead and do it. I, I'm wondering if this was your motivation for doing the video. The standards for going into the Hall of Fame are very, very lax. Uh, there's no official voting system. There's no um, consideration for what you did in your career, really. It's just kind of like if Vince likes you or Vince thinks he can make money off of you. That's exactly okay. right. Yep. Right. And how does – and I, he's probably a very nice guy. I don't know. never met the guy. How is the Godfather in the Hall of Fame over all the guys we just mentioned? I mean, how did that happen? <laughs> I, I've been giving it some thought, and he had some runs. I mean, Papa Shango. Uh, failed runs. I mean, Papa Shango was a failure. Eh. <laughs> I mean, I, I guess, but there was that. There was Kama. That, the, that was also not... <laughs> no, that, that, was, that, was a, that was a fucking abortion. Let's be honest. That was horrible. Um, I did not like the comic gimmick at all. I, I didn't get it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there was also, you know, the Godfather. And why is he going in as the Godfather as well? Because they're PG, remember? I, so, I, you know, that gimmick never made sense to me because I never understood why he didn't get arrested. And did you? Did he have any really great matches as that character either? No, he was just, he was, and, and not that there's anything wrong with that. He was a popcorn match guy. That's all he was. And that's what Hacksaw was for most of his career. But he, <laughs> he didn't, you know, it's not like there was a whole lot of substance to that character and that they did many great things with it. He was just a guy that they brought out to get some pops once in a while. Right, and it was an excuse to get more bimbos in, in, in bikinis out there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It was perfect for the Attitude Era. Right, it just doesn't make any sense to me now to put him in as that character. Considering they're PG, it would probably make more sense to make him Papa Shango. Um, or just use his real name, Charles Wright. They don't do that. I mean, Kevin Nash went in as Diesel. They don't use real names. Real names don't exist. 
<laughs> well, Vince has, and this is one of my weird things with Vince, where it's like he hates last names or first names. Like you have to have just one name. It can't just you can't be Adrian Neville and you can't be uh, Biggie Langston. It has to be Biggie and Neville. And I'm like, sure, Vince. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Charlotte is Ric Flair's daughter, but she doesn't have a last name. Uh, <laughs> Ric Flair has a last name. Charlotte, however, does not. Um, so uh, wouldn't Etika dictate that she'd be Charlotte Flair? I mean, okay. They, they do that with a lot of them. But then again, you got Sasha Banks. Well, she's got a first and last name, and uh, I'm, I'm drawing up a one. Becky Lynch. Well, they can't. You know, the funny thing about Sasha Banks is that her name is tied into some of the the moves that she has. So it's like you can't you can't just call her Sasha because then her the move of her or the uh, the name of her finisher makes no sense. The bank statement. It was like, so it doesn't really make sense. And you can't just call her banks because that's stupid. <laughs> yeah, so, I, I don't know. Uh, Becky Lynch, I keep waiting for them to just drop the Lynch and just call her Becky. What's up, Bex? I don't know, man. So, yeah, that, that actually, though, you, i got to give you credit. That is exactly why I did the list is because the Godfather's going, and I'm thinking, all right, you know, nothing against the guy, and, and for that matter, everybody points to Coco Beware as the reason, you know. He's oh, one of mine, too, where I'm like, really? <laughs> I don't have I a mean, problem no, with it. I, I really nothing don't. against Coco. I'm not bashing Coco. I'm, everyone says he's a really nice guy. We talked to him on the phone. A very sweet dude, charismatic, but I, when you compare him to the guys that we just listed, it's like, really? <laughs> it's like, well, he got I mean, in before Savage? Seriously, that happened? Yeah, but you're right, and I, and I understand your reasoning, but you also have to look at it like this. The NFL last year inducted a punter uh-huh. into the Hall of Fame, and it's like at some point... Yeah, but great, punters are important, though. He's the only punter in history to go in the Hall of Fame. I mean, yeah. and, and to be one of the only to play that position, I mean, I don't even know his name. It's Al something, I think. I, I don't remember his name, but... Mm-hmm. It, it, it's it's you're not going to find an NFL special, a football life, Al something other, the punter, right, you know, right. It's, it's not going to happen. Um, and that's the same thing with with Coco, and, and I'm fine with Coco being in his runs elsewhere. I mean, he worked everywhere, um, never uh, at a high level, um, you know, top of the card, but he's iconic. I would argue he's more iconic than The Godfather. I still maintain that if you put him on a bill today, 2016, at a local uh, indie show, more people would show up to see the Birdman, Coco Beware, than to see the Godfather. And I maintain that. Well, I mean, um, I, I don't, I don't want to phrase that. I think that they would probably be brought on to the show. Both of those guys would probably be brought onto the show to get like a popcorn match pop or a nostalgia pop out of a crowd that's already there to see something else. Well, a lot and of these shows... And that's fine. Again, there's nothing wrong with that. But Well, it's like, hon- same with Honky Tonk Man. Honky Tonk Man lives around here. You know, the only guy, he's the only guy on some of these local shows, and there's only really one running, um, that I ever understand who the hell he is. They put out a poster, it's like, don't know him, don't know her, don't know that. Who are these guys? Oh, they got the Honky Tonk Man. And that's what a lot of these shows are. They They have one name from the past that will sell the show. And then obviously the work rate of the other guys is going to be what, you know, hopefully mm-hmm. will impress you enough to come back. But Right, right. What are you going to do? Anyway, so that's that was the reasoning behind the list. I think that the idea that every year they can put in however many true legends and not have some deviation on the quality is is, is ridiculous because – the I mean, in all honesty, Vince McMahon on, on Raw, it was edited out, but live in person when Shane McMahon came out, he said, "I'm gonna fuck you up." <laughs> they edited it. Like, is that what he said? Yes. They edited it in a cell phone video been posted on YouTube. If you doubt me, so you can you can YouTube that. Um, so if we're gonna go over that material where we can use adult material and all that, here's where I'm gonna defend the Attitude Era, because I don't actually like the Attitude Era, but. I'm going to defend it. There was big personalities that sold those shows. Steve Austin, The Undertaker, 
even I'll even include Edge in that. Uh, that that Shawn Michaels, Triple H, these guys sold those shows. Well, I don't think that the guys we have right now can do that. So yes, they can go out there and they can have filthy, dirty language. They can have as many bimbos bending over in thongs as they want. If the talent's not there, who's going to care? If the well, persona's not there, who's going to care? Here's the other side of that. Is it the? And this is where I can kind of tie this into Lucha Underground a little bit. Is it the talent, or is it the writers and the producers telling them what to do and limiting them and not capturing the essence of their personality? And the reason I bring up Lucha Underground, um, Katrina, on that show, did you know she was a former NXT girl? No, did not. She came from NXT, and I've seen her work in NXT. She is bland as fuck. So I don't know how you go from that to being the a sexy version of Paul Bearer and being awesome at it, but... She did it. It's like, okay, so what did WWE not capture with her? That, I mean, what, was it her not bringing something to the table? Was it her not being developed enough yet? I don't know, but all I know is that when she's outside of the WWE system, she's amazing. Well, if I turn around and look at my wall right now, and you'll probably see it at the beginning of this, this YouTube video, there's guys on there. There's Macho and Hogan and, uh, and Brett. And in any situation, they are who they are. And, and they're larger than life, and their personalities that are going to be recognized, no matter where they go or what they do or whatever. They I actually do have a theory life. about that, but <laughs> What's it's your funny. Theory? And I, I can talk. I, we, I talked about this because uh, uh, the Full House spinoff show debuted today on Netflix, Fuller House, mm-hmm. and I was talking about it with somebody that watched it. I haven't seen it yet, but um, he was talking about how like the child actors on the show are terrible, like really bad. And I was like, man, the child actors seemed so much better when we were kids. It's like, well, that's because they had overbearing parents that forced them into this shit and basically, like, forced them to be good, basically. It was bad circumstances that got quality. I wondered if the personalities that you saw in wrestling from the 80s came out of bad circumstances, which are, they were on drugs and, <laughs> and lived a rock and roll lifestyle and all sorts of other things like that. And that's how you get, like crazy, fucked up, over-the-top personalities like that, whereas today, you know, it's mostly kids that grew up watching it when they were younger, that are just kind of like, you know, a little bit more chill and like more normalized, I guess you could say. Yeah, but normal is boring. I know, I mean, I know, I'm just saying. It's do like, I want to watch some guy come out with the, with the, with the crew cut and, and black wrestling trunks have a boring match where he can do 8,000 moves, but none of it means shit? Or do I want to watch oh, yeah. Jim Duggan run to the ring with the American flag, scream, ho, and get the whole crowd involved in a match that ultimately has maybe three moves, if you count a punch as a move? Oh, well, that, that's the other part of it. That's um, You mentioned the matches don't mean anything and the moves don't mean anything. It's like that's, a, that, that's something I put uh, almost entirely on the bookers and the writers today because so many matches in the WWE, so many matches do not matter at all. Like... I'm gonna I'm gonna throw a number out there and I bet I'm right. I'm willing to bet that ninety percent of the matches have no impact on future storylines or build ups or anything. It's just you see the same fucking matches every week. How many times do we need to see a goddamn tag team main event? Yeah. How many times uh, how many times do I need to see the same guy? I, I, like, fucking, at the pay-per-view, the last pay-per-view they did, it was Dolph Ziggler versus Kevin Owens. They were like, if I fucking see that match one more time, I'm going to jump off a cliff. Because it's, I've seen it, like, 45 times on Raw. Right. So and, they beat you into apathy with the way they present their show and the way they book their show. And it's not conducive to creative excellence. And I know that the guys, uh, the, the wrestlers themselves, very few of them are allowed to come up with their own shit. Like, Roman Reigns, do you really think he's coming up with his own shit? And that's no, not just Vince telling him what to project. do? He's definitely Vince's project. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And like, because no human being alive would willingly do that stuff themselves. Right. He looks uncomfortable doing it. And that's that's why he's not over, ultimately. Oh, <laughs> that goes without... Yeah, exactly. But I was so sorry for him. That's true. We Our interview, one of the two interviews on this show... Um, was Alex Porto, and he said that he was brought in along with uh, Freddie Joe Floyd, who was Tracy Smothers, as mm-hmm. well as uh, The Goon, which was Bill Irwin, and a bunch of other guys, uh, T.L. Hopper, I don't remember what his real name was. They were all brought in together to be the guys that would get wins on Superstars and Challenge, yet when they faced the Superstars on Raw, 
They'd be credible enough to look good in the ring with them, but if they but if they lost to them, it would be something a little bit better than a squash match, but still, ultimately, they were enhancement talent. Right. And you don't and, get that anymore. And, and, and I think that's a better idea than having, you know, Mike Duffy or, or Dale Wolf or whatever other, you know, 80s jobber who never won anything. They just they just looked they looked like their gear was shitty and their their in ring work was subpar. And they got in there and they lost and it was like, well, they, yeah, they beat nobody. You know, he beat they beat that dollar store toy that the GI Joe guy kills. You know, it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. You, you know, he, and but what they tried to create was a mid level guy that maybe they're going to push him, maybe they're not. Maybe there's a little bit of suspense to it, but ultimately they're the enhancement guy right so right. that's what they need to bring back now because if they did that we wouldn't be seeing Dolph Ziggler against uh Kevin Owens on Raw every week because Kevin Owens would be facing let's take an NXT guy you know um whoever is still employed and there you go uh you know, and they have, they, I, I, that's the thing NXT if you watch that show they do a lot of those things where they'll have like they'll have guys just beat fucking nobodies and it's like okay cool and then it, the side effect of that is it's so funny to read reviews of the NXT shows, like the weekly shows, not the TakeOver specials, mm-hmm. and they'll say, oh, this match was boring because it was just squash. I'm like, yeah, but then if – I'm just right. Let's say Sami Zayn does a big move to the guy that he squashed or something. I don't know. I'm just throwing names out there. He does a big move. And then he turns around like three weeks later, he has a match with Samoa Joe where he does that same big move that he beat the guy with. But then it's like, oh, my God, that actually – is, is he going to beat Joe with that move? And it's just it's little things like that that are completely lost on the main roster show right now. And that is a caveat of ratings. Vince feels, mm-hmm. and, and he's apparently said now because of the network, oh, ratings don't matter anymore. I don't buy that for a second. Um, okay. He, oh, ratings don't matter anymore. They're still going to watch our stuff. And it's like, I don't believe that he believes that. That's something that's said to try to calm down the uh, the, the people who own the stocks. You know, this way, when when Raw's rating hits 1.3 million people or something crazy like that one week, and we came close to that uh, at the beginning of the year, got some pretty low ratings for, for Raw, um, mm-hmm. down in the two millions, a couple of them, for, which again for Raw is a really low number. Um, where was it going with that? Well, ultimately, that means that the next day the stock isn't going to tank because they're going to go, holy shit, they're dying. So. You know, it, it's. Well, if it wasn't a problem, Shane wouldn't have brought it up on Raw. <laughs> just, just a thought, but you know. There you go. Yeah, I, I got opinions on that, but I think we'll save that for next week. Next week's guest, by the way, is uh, speaking of Lucha Underground, Johnny Mundo, John Morrison. He's another guy that you took him out of the WWE system. You look at him in Lucha Underground; he's amazing. Well, he was amazing there in WWE, but they just wouldn't, you know, give him the break. They wanted to push the Miz. It, it was bizarre. Yeah, he never developed on the mic, though. That was kind of, and and I think you see him now in Lucha with these like incredible like cinematic scenes that he does with all these guys. It's like, no, he can he can do it. I mean, he's not not great, but he's better than he was in the WWE, and he has matches that show off his skills too. So it's uh, okay. I don't know what WWE was missing the boat on there, but it's yeah. fine. All right, man. Well, until next week, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. I want to thank the Iron Sheik. I want to thank Gian Megan. I want to also thank Alex Porto for joining us. And, Pat, of course, thank you for being part of this. And, uh, oh, thank you for having me. You know, we came up with 10 different guys, 11 if you count a tag team, uh, who should be in the Hall of Fame that aren't. So if anybody's out there listening, you know, it wouldn't be the first time. Take one of our ideas and run with it, because it, it's, it's about time. And speaking of Hall of Fame, uh, Bobby Heenan's Hall of Fame page on WrestlingEpicenter.com will be up sometime next week. It is written. It is done. The pictures are ready to be put on there. And uh, Bobby Heenan will be our third official inductee and our, our uh, fifth official guy, because the second inductee was the Poffo family, all three, uh, Angelo, Lanny, and Macho. So hopefully everybody cool. checks out the Hall of Fame section. It's a pretty cool thing. If you like to read, guys, uh, like to read, I put a lot out there to read on these things. So um, check it out. It's it's definitely an interesting read. And hey, thanks again, man. Thank you again, and thank you again for tuning in to Interactive Wrestling Radio right here on WrestlingEpicenter.com. <laughs>